Hello and welcome to today's live streamed Melbourne Symphony Orchestra event. My name is Davinia Caddy, I'm a music academic and author. In just an hour, um, the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra will be taking their places here on stage at the Hamer Hall for the final rehearsal of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and Persephone. Now, for this monumental program, the MSO will be led by their chief conductor, Sir Andrew Davis, who has joined me here at Hamer Hall to give us an insight into these two quite different pieces. Welcome, Sir Andrew. Thank you very much. So, for audiences unfamiliar with both these works, what could they expect from the performance? Well, um, let's talk about the Rite of Spring, first of all which was the early, earlier of the two pieces. Mm. It was premiered in 1913 and caused a sensation, as you know. Yes. <laughs> um, there were sort of riots in the theater and there were various reasons given for the, the sort of scandal that it, mm. that it was. One was that the choreography was terrible. Mm. Uh, the music, of course, was something that had never been um, heard before. The, mm. the kind of, um, especially the, the rhythmic demands of the piece were just uh, beyond anything that any orchestra had been asked to do before. Mm. Stravinsky had already written two ballets for Sergei Diaghilev, the for great- For the same company. For the, for the Ballet mm. Russe, uh, and uh, the, the, the Firebird, and yep. then Petrushka. And they were quite, they had some quite modern things in them, but mm. nothing really prepared anyone for the Rite of Spring. Mm. So uh, it's extremely visceral music. Okay. It starts with a very, very high bassoon solo. Mm. So the first thing, so the American orchestras actually uh, the, the, have, a, have, a, have words to it, which is, I'm not an English horn. <laughs> 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 um, um, but the, and, and this, for me, is like the first stirrings of, mm. uh, of the earth emerging from winter, this kind of mm. plaintive chant mm. from them soon and then there's a whole first section where different very short motifs from the cor anglais and the oboe and the alto flute and uh, e flat clarinet trumpet and they all combine to make this sort of huge tapestry i suppose you mm. call it of sound that again was something that nobody had heard before uh, it's 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 like a you know, Jackson Pollock throwing different layers ah. onto a canvas, you know, yeah. and, and, and you end up with this extraordinary, well, I won't say cacophony, because it's actually, but there's this huge texture that's sort of been built up from all these things. Mm. So the, the, the winds have quite a large role then? The woodwind uh, indeed have, have some very complicated things to do in the piece, mm. and, and, and the, you see it right away in that, that first section, which is mm. mainly woodwind. Mm. Um, and then the sort of rhythmical thing starts, mm. the dance of the adolescence, which is um, a very well-known passage, I think. Um, and if those of you who've actually seen the famous film Fantasia, the, the ah, Disney Disney's, film. Ah, yes. yeah, 1940 just, something. I think, I think so. Yeah. That's where actually you've got sort mm. of seas of lava and, mm. and the music is going rum, bum, 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 and every bum, yeah, <laughs> it's a the volcano. Of, no, no, well, this is sort of a, a lava bubble explodes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very striking. But um, and then uh, again, there 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 are slow sections which mm. which are rather sort of ritualistic in a mm. way. There's this, uh, and again, to me, it's like the earth stirring. Mm. Uh, but then there are, there are these pagan dances. I mean, the whole thing is a, a pagan ritual. Yes. And it ends with the uh, dance of the chosen one. And this is a, a young woman who is chosen and dances herself to death. Chosen as a sacrifice. Chosen as a mm. sacrifice, yes. Mm. Not as beauty queen. No, no, no. <laughs> um, and so it, it has this really pagan, um, barbaric feel to mm. it. And I think that's... A, that's the thing. But it is one of the most exciting things you can hear. Mm. And some of the music is very fast and wild. And, mm. and there's a section towards the end of part one where 
where the horns and the violas are going, and then the trumpet's coming. I mean, it's just, it's hair raising. I mean, you sort of sit on the edge of your seat. Audiences today, do you think they'll be sitting on the edge of their seats? Oh, good Lord, yes. So the I music still has that impact? Uh, absolutely. 106 years later, yeah, it's still, yeah. I know, it's still as mm. it, it, shocking, but in a way, viscerally, as I say, viscerally mm. exciting in a way that's, there's no other piece in the, in the orchestral mm. repertoire like it. It's interesting that, is, that it is, of course, orchestral repertoire, as, as you've just said, it was written as, as these, the, the soundtrack, the accompaniment to a ballet in 1913, and then uh, the subsequent year, 1914, I think it was premiered for the first time as concert hall music, and right. as then, a, a, as you know, accrued a large significance as orchestral music. Right. To what extent do you envisage the dancing, or do you encourage the orchestral members to be aware of the stomping and the quite aggressive movements that originally went along with the music not at all oh, you don't? <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough no i have no i've i did have conducted it once as a ballet, as a ballet oh, at, okay. at la scala in milan oh, nice. but it was interesting because it was a it was a hungarian ballet company and the, it was a choreography by beja a very famous yeah. choreographer and the, the 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 company arrived and i had a meeting with the choreographer and he said you can do whatever you like we've done this with you know, so many different orchestras and so many different conductors oh, really? and so many different tempo tempos and it, we can adjust to whatever. So, so, okay, mm. so I don't even need to look at the stage, you mm. know. Mostly if you're conducting a ballet, you have to look up to make sure that you're not mm. making the prima ballerina sort yeah. of <laughs> stand on stand on her point too long. Yeah, you know? I, I guess the orchestra has its own sort of physical aspect. I was speaking to the chief timpanist yesterday and he was saying that he feels his role is essentially that of a second conductor. Yeah, that's and right. when he's doing his stuff on the timpani, he himself is sort of bringing the orchestra together and he feels almost like a mirror of you, though of course he is some distance from, from you on your podium. Yeah, well, in the, the dance sacral, the, yeah, the, towards the, the end, sacrificial yes. dance at yes. the end. Where the, the rhythm goes, and the timpani is 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 playing mainly on on the on the beats, but they're very uneven beats. Yes. So so it's very important that the timpanist has a great sense of rhythm, which yes. which he does. Which he does. Yes. <laughs> and I know some conductors sort of cheat in their beating and try and make it fit into some sort of regular triple time or duple time. Do you go by what Stravinsky's written on oh, your yes. score? Oh yes, I, I, I think that, that, that Bernstein at one point yes. decided he was going to re... Re sort of bar re it. Re it, yeah. yes. So instead of going bum, bim, bum, bum, it went boom, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> it's sort just, of jazzy. Well, it's sort of syncopated. That's, yeah. the, that's not what the piece no, is. You no. know? So the, 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 the irregularity of the rhythm is yeah. part of its excitement. Mm. And there have been so many different performances and recordings with, with conductors all over the world across the last sort of century in a smidgen. Um, and you mentioned a minute ago that you, you like to conform to how Stravinsky's original was perhaps intended, as well as the, the, the notation of the meter. Do you also think quite specifically about Stravinsky's tempo markings and his vol uh, dynamic markings, or do you sort of...? Well, yes, mainly the dynamic markings. You have to make a few adjustments, actually, just to clarify some of the textures. Yes. There's, there's a place towards the end of part one where the mm. ho high horns are, are playing these uh, this rather sustained music, and then mm. the, there's a sort of chant going on in the tubers, yeah. uh, and, uh, and then a sort of chugging going on in the bassoons mm. underneath. Um, and then there's this rhythmical motif that comes in the oboes and the... And the uh, the um, uh, sixth and eighth horns, I think it is. Oh, okay. um, um, uh, but if if the if the horns and the tubas are playing too loud, then you don't tend to hear yeah. this. So in other words, there are some things that you have to. You need that sort of textural clarity, don't you, to sort of capture each line in this massive sort of polyphonic texture. Yeah, that's right. Because you know, again, this is another point, like the very beginning, where yeah. the things are being built up by different musical mm. ideas, motifs mm. being added to mm. the texture. So. Um, as far as Stravinsky's metronome marks are concerned, um, I think they're mainly in the, in the right, they're, they're mm. very good. Um, Most he himself, mind you, when we recorded it. He changes his yes, mind. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, notoriously. And some conductors, I think you mentioned to me um, yesterday, like to take the slow bits a bit too slow, you think? I they feel so, of, yes. They but, sort of uh, almost uh, yeah. drag, you know? Yes, well, the, yes, there are a couple of passages that, um, that are weighty. Yes, with that earthiness. Yes, that's yeah. right. But, but on the other hand, if, you, if it's too slow, there's no sort of forward motion to yeah. the thing. And that's, that's always the balance to try and strike. Mm. Mm. Um, if we move uh, to Persephone, the other piece on um, the programme this week, why do you think it is that we don't really know much about this piece? Um, it's not something that students or scholars have really paid much attention to over the last few decades. Well, it's partly because it's a, it's a curious hybrid, ah. because um, it was commissioned by Ida Rubenstein, who oh, was a da Russian dancer? Yeah, yes. she was a she was a dancer and actress. Yes. so she spoke mm. as well. So she wanted something that she could both speak, yes. and and dance. Um, so so it ends up being a, a, a piece for her. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, when you don't stage it with ballet, which of course we're not. Yes. Um, then then she just speaks. Yes. Um, and then there's a tenor. Eumolpus, who is basically the narrator yes. of, the, of mm. the thing. The text in French is by André Gide, a very famous poet of the time, yes. who actually didn't like the music at all, <laughs> as it, but, um, um, but uh, so, because actually Stravinsky didn't compose a lot of, of music in French, although he lived in Paris for quite for a, a long, long time. time yes. yeah. So um, he became a superstar, I guess, in Paris with the fire burden. Oh that's yeah, really yes. where his reputation was yes. sort of cemented. No, that's right. Mm. And 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 but by the time he wrote Persephone, it was he, which was dates from 1934. Mm. He'd moved into what we call his neoclassical period, oh. and that's you know when he was sort of influenced by you know Bach. I mean the the, the most Bachian piece is. Mm. Uh, is the little concerto for a chamber orchestra called Dunbarton Oaks, right. which is sounds very much like a steal from the third Brandenburg at one point. Oh, okay. you know, da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, so he sort of reverts back to Baroque texts and Baroque melodies. Yes, uh, and and there is something of, of that aspect to uh, to Persephone. Mm. The, 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 the similar piece that is be much better known is Oedipus Rex. Yes. And, and that didn't have any ballet component, but he called it an opera oratorio, so it's sometimes staged, but it works very well as a concert piece. But Seventy works as a concert piece as well, but you obviously do miss that one mm. element that, mm. that, uh, the, of the dance that's supposed to be there. The style of the piece, comparison to the Rite of Spring, it, it's very different. There's a lot of very slow, what I might call hieratic music, you oh, know, rather, yeah. rather, um, um, what's the other word I would I would use for it? Um, Stately. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, statuesque. Oh, okay. Um, she was quite a statuesque figure, I think. Ida Rubinstein. Was she? Yes. I, I think she was very, very tall, quite thin, and almost sort of masculine-looking in her uh -huh. uh, sort of silhouette. I think she commanded quite a lot of attention for her physical form. She was quite a character, I believe, uh, at this time in Paris. I think she may have even had like a puma in her apartment or something. There was something <laughs> strange I remember reading about her having a very strange pet. Uh, and Diagolev <laughs> used to come around to see this pet or something. I'm sure I read that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, I, I could quite believe it of her. She, yeah. was, she was certainly a character. So she commissioned these? She commissioned right. it, yes. And, um, and, and she had a, a ballet company of her own. Yes, so it she was did. Her, it was her company mm. that, that premiered it. Mm. Um, there's a big part for the chorus also. Right. Um, who, uh, and, and the piece, we called this whole, whole program Rites of Spring. Yes, I noticed because, on the yeah, poster. Yes, because um, Persephone is, is, is a myth about spring. Persephone was the daughter of Demeter, who was okay. the goddess of, of um, uh, fertility and crops. And, and, right. And uh, in, as with most Greek myths, there are about 23 different versions of mm. it. This is the Persephone myth. <laughs> uh, it's more common for the, for the, um, the idea that actually Persephone was kidnapped and taken down to Hades by Pluto, the oh. king of the underworld. Mm. In this version, on the other hand, she actually looks into the, the callus of, of 
of a of a narcissus flower. Oh, okay. And as she looks into it, she sees this vision of these tormented souls in mm. hell, mm. wandering hopelessly by the river sticks, you know, and, and, and she takes pity on them. Mm. So she actually chooses to go down there. Oh. Uh, and of course, what happens when she leaves the earth and goes down into the underworld is the earth mourns her absence and, and winter arrives. Right. Well, we're sort of in the underground here in, in, in yeah. Hamer Hall, which is sort of built halfway uh, down beneath. Yes, beneath. I've never thought of the Hades myself. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe the bassoonist does. I don't know. <laughs> um. So, so, so in, in the second part, she's down there in, in, in hell. Um, but then, of course, she has the yearning to, for mm. the earth again. Mm. And so eventually a character called Trip, Tripolin, Triple M mm. comes and rescues her and takes her. Actually, Andre, she, there were, there's Triple M and another character who, who okay. is sort of the, 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 the god of, or the, the, the figure who looks after tilling the soil in, yeah, in another okay. Greek myth. Mm. And he got them confused. They're actually two brothers, and he sort of thought they were the same thing, but <laughs> never mind. <laughs> so, so she goes back up yeah. to, the, um, to the world, to the earth. And then spring comes, spring and of comes. course, so yeah. so it's it's a, a kind of um, mm. parable, a, a kind of metaphor right. for you know the the, and the, 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 the seed it. dying bef to be, to to be yeah. reborn in the spring. Yeah, uh, and, and that was the whole background of the Greek myth. Mm. And it's um, there is some fast music, but in it, but not a lot. Right. So this is in a way. That, where I say this, it couldn't be less like the Rite of Spring. Yes. The, Which is um, sort of edge of your seat stuff. Yeah, yes. Mm. I mean, it's it starts with the very, with the, the soloist um, just telling us, giving us an introduction, and saying, you know, Homer tells us this, and Homer tells us yeah. that, which is sort of set to uh, accompaniment of um, horns and woodwinds and later mm. trumpets. Uh, and and, it, and it's, as I say, it's very ritualistic in mm, feeling. Mm. And, and then we have the chorus, the ladies of the chorus first coming in and, and saying, "Oh, stay and play with us, Persephone, you, you know, and you are, you you, and all these flowers." And there's a list of, of flowers that are that are mm. in bloom. It's mm. very very beautiful section. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I could. Go on what, about what more does details. The, what does the I chorus think. sort of do then? What do they add to the to the work? Do they have a narrative function, or are they sort of just another layer of musical text? Well, there? no, they're, they're characters really. Right, I mean, so yeah. you know, uh, this first appearance of the Sopranos and Altos, they're her companions. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, they are the spirits mm. in the underworld mm. later on. Uh, and one of the most brilliant strokes for me mm. is that in part three, mm. so there are three parts. Yes, so. You know the the first part when she's in uh, uh, on the earth and then goes down, and then the second part in Hades, and when she got, then third part when she comes back. Uh, there, the, all of a sudden, in part three, children's voices appear, uh -huh. and you know there's something so magical mm. about the sound, and, and and pure and innocent, and, mm. and boys and girls, boys and girls. Yeah. So so we have both the Australian Girls Choir and the National Boys Choir of oh, Australia great. combining. We had interesting. There's a lot of people down here. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, the stage is full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and so th at the end, basically the chorus and the Eumolpi, the tenor, po sing this uh, sort of chant at the end mm. that basically that talks about, you know, the the seed dying and yes. and, and being reborn and mm. this cont continuous. Mm. Self-renewing cycle of life. Mm. I, I I found the piece intensely moving, but yeah. you know it's one of those. It's contemplative a lot of the right. time. Right. Yeah. It hasn't been performed in Australia for a while. I think over fifty years. Oh crikey! God, yes, that, I know. It? It's, it's something. A good amount of time. Yeah. I've, I haven't done it a lot myself. I did it in London a couple oh, of times and okay. with the BBC Symphony Orchestra and, and took it to to the Palais des Beaux Arts in Brussels. Oh, and, yes. lovely. So it, it's a piece I like, and I've done it with Paul Groves, our soloist here. Right. Um, on all those occasions, mm. I think. Um, so uh, for me, it was a wonderful opportunity mm. to compare these two pieces, which mm. are so different in style, mm. and yet both have these mm. wonderful elements of Stravinsky, his 
his sense of colour with the orchestra mm. is is extraordinary. Timbre. Yes, the absolutely. Sort of of yes, this. and 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 there's a marvellous passage uh, in part three where the strings alternate with with flutes, and then this trio of flutes and the trio mm. of oboes. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this sort of rather pastoral music, okay. but um, um, he gives us an opportunity, I guess, to see a different side to Stravinsky, a composer who we could argue had lots of different faces, sort of throughout his oh, his very life. many, and of course his last pieces mm. when he uh, he was sort of persuaded by Robert Kraft, who was this gentleman who, yes. who kind of looked after him and, mm. and, and wrote his biography and wrote yeah there, well writings. there are se there are several books of their conversations yes yes there are uh, and he became Sarinsky became very interested in the in the uh, the the serial composers you yes. know the, uh, the Schoenberg Begum, but particularly Webern, who is another composer we hear very little of these exactly. days. Exactly. Just to explain for some for some listeners, serialism means means what exactly? Well, I, it was uh, Arnold Schoenberg, who was this composer, late nineteen to uh, early part. He died in nineteen fifty three or fifty four, mm. I think. And he, abs abs well, how should we put it? He sort of oversaw the mm. the disintegration of the of the system of, of keys and and so on the scales that we and all scales learn. that we all use yeah. which yeah. Are, and the rot set in really with wagner <laughs> <laughs> oh famously the opening of tristan and isolde is yes. you know this extraordinarily beautiful chromatic harmony that you, mm. you you're not quite sure where it's, where going, it's going next yeah. so you're in one key but then you think oh no maybe we're no, we're not key. there so yeah. the, this sense of being rooted always in mm. in a particular key that mm. of course in the classical uh, classical compositions, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, yes. you're very clearly yes. in one key. Although I have to say in late Mozart, in some of the piano oh, concertos particularly, he, he, all of a sudden you've got a, a piece in C major and, and you're in C sharp minor in the Crikey. middle of the development section. He, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, but... Um, so serialism's where you sort of abandon the scales and the tonality and... Well, yeah, Schoenberg, his theory was that since tonality was disappearing, mm. the, the, the old-fashioned scale was irrelevant, yes. and that all twelve notes in the, in the octave, you yes. know, between C and C, for yes. instance, should have equal, equal value. Weight. Mm. So he developed this system of, uh, and he would for each piece he'd have what he called a note row, which mm. included all the the twelve mm. notes of the chromatic scale, yes. but in a particularly selected order. Right. And then he took that order of, of, of the of the notes yeah. and based his whole composition yeah. technique on that. It's sort of mathematical in a way. Well, yes. And Stravinsky took on board this? And well, in, in, at the end of his life. Yes. Um, uh, not all the details of, of that technique, but, but, but the, uh, the sort of spare um, mm quite cerebral in a way. Yes. And so the late pieces are uh, really not played that often. And no. there's some of them are beautiful. There's a marvelous cantata he wrote f um, f for the city of Venice, which was designed to be performed in St. Mark's Basilica. Oh, really? Uh, called the Canticum Sacrum, which I think oh, is a marvelous yeah. piece. Oh, I don't know that one. No, well, there you go. No. <laughs> the you famous, famous place, St. Mark's Basilica. Yes, one um, of the most magical places. I mean, Venice. I, I have to say, Stravinsky is buried in Venice. Ah, is he? Did you not know that? I don't think I did. Yeah, well, and, and you go to the uh, the cemetery island of San Michele. Oh, I yeah. have been to there, yes. but I didn't know he was and, there. And you there. know, because Venice is the way it is, yeah, you, know, you, 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 you can't really dig down very no. far before <laughs> you, you're in the lagoon. Yeah. So most of the uh, of the cemetery island is, you know, there there are there are people sort of <laughs> stacked up on top of each yeah. other just to yeah. make you through. But then you get to this little um, corner. Which is the Russian Orthodox part, oh, which right. of course is not so many, not, not yeah, so big demand so for it. Yeah. Uh, and there's this. Uh, so I always go there when I go to oh, Venice and, and pay, your pay my respects to Stravinsky. And he has a very simple grave. It's just a block of uh, a rectangular block of stone. It says Igor Stravinsky. That's mm. all. But mm. then you go a hundred yards down the row, okay. and there is this elaborate mausoleum thing. Oh, crikey! It's Diaghilev. Oh, right. Yes, I did know he Who commissioned his there. early ballets, and, yes. and the, the the difference in the temperament of the two That's men is so, so brilliantly yeah. encapsulated by these two monuments: the simplicity of one and the, and the sort of yeah. pretension almost of yes. the other. And in a way, this program will, like I say, draw our attention to two different aspects of Stravinsky, two different musical styles. 
styles, two different musical personalities. What do you think uh, for yourself as conductor are the challenges of the programme? Well, uh, really bringing out the, the differences between the two pieces. You know, the, the, the extremely visceral, physical yep. um, exhilaration of, mm. of, the, of the ride. Mm. Uh, and this cool, you know, looking back at ancient mm. Greece, storytelling. Mm. But um, there are some mar marvelous moments. There's um, uh, really some very exciting things from the orchestra. Um, the beginning of part three is, is a case in point. Mm. Um, but on the whole, it's a piece that is, is, is his most neoclassical in the sense that, mm. it, you know, if we look back and how we feel about ancient Greece and Rome, mm. you know, we, we tend to idealize it, especially, yes. especially Greece. Yes. And you think of, you know, the, the intellectual world of um, the philosophers of in Athens, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, and Plato and yes, Aristotle yeah. Yes. Um, and, and also the myths. Mm. I mean, Greek myths are extraordinary and mm. um, enormously varied mm. because actually, the, you know, they were developed over centuries. And as I say, mm. the, with Persephone, there are mm. several different versions mm. of, the, of, of the same basic story. And you find that also, for instance, with Orpheus. Yes. You know, uh, after Orpheus has tragically lost his wife for the second time because mm. being allowed to go down to Hades and bring her back, but not being but being told not to look look at look her, at look, her. turn around and look at her, yeah. and he couldn't resist it, and yeah. so he lost her twice. Oh now there are various different versions. Mm. One of that is that they, the gods took pity on him; they mm. gave gave him his wife back anyway. Mm. Uh, but there's another version that um, the Furies, you know, the, you, have the, you have the Graces and the, fu the yeah. Furies who were these nasty sort of <laughs> people, uh, were so angry with him for, for doing that. They, they tore his body to pieces, mm. but his head floated down the river his disembodied still head. singing. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> it's amazing how what, you can still sing when dying in so many musical works. Well, one of the weird things about Santa, Saint Cecilia, yeah. you know, the patron saint, saint of music, yes. uh, and, and really read her biography, it's very hard to see mm. a very tenuous connection with music, actually, mm. except mm. that uh, supposedly when she was, her wedding ceremony, because, mm. well, we're going off on a tangent here, but, you know, <laughs> she, she married this chap and said, well, I'll marry you, but you realize there's going to be no, none of that, oh, you know, right. no hanky-panky, no, hanky because my guardian angel won't allow it. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, I, I'm sorry, I really am digressing. But uh, the point is that um, actually, uh, at the end of her life, the, the Romans actually decided to execute her. And so, mm. But the chap who was chopping off her head didn't do a very good job. Oh, so so she staggered out. around for four days with a semi-severed head, oh, praising God. the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. As you do. As yeah. you do. Um, so, Andrew, this is the final year of your um, sort of tenureship, you, your, your position as chief conductor of the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. What have been your highlights? Oh, well, there have been so many. Um, well, we've, we've been working our way through all the Mahler symphonies, yes. for one thing. We just did the 10th earlier this year, which, mm. of course, is remarkable. Mm. Um, completion of this, mm. the, the unfinished sketches. Um, we haven't done the 8th yet. The, inf the infamous symphony of a thousand. That's massive proportions. Yeah, it is huge, but um, mm. all I can say about it, that is watch this space. Ah, <laughs> something may be coming. So that was exciting. Also, I did a wonderful series of... of um, recordings that the ABC uh, has made, right. CD, CDs of the works of Richard Strauss. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, you know, the big pieces like um, the Ein Heldenleben and yeah. the Alpine Symphony yeah. and... Uh, um, Alzo's Platt. Alzo's Platt. Alzo, Alzo Sprach, I can never say anymore. But <laughs> yeah, thus speaks. <laughs> spoke, uh, this Zoroaster, they oh call him. Anyway, yeah. uh, but, you know, Don, Don Juan and Tillor yeah. and Spiegel and, and, yeah. and the interludes from the mm. opera intermezzo and all sorts of things, yeah. the four last songs. Mm, uh, that's a marvellous mm. series of, the, of CDs available from the ABC. Um, <laughs> But we also recorded for, for Chandos, well, several things. Most recently, the, the beautiful Childhood of Christ by Berlioz. Ah, oh, right, yes. Uh, mm. And we, we recorded a 3D, 
a three CD set of, of works of Charles Ives, the great oh. and very it's a peculiar uh, sort of guy. Peculiar, yeah. and groundbreaking yeah. uh, composer at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. Mm. Um, the, cur the extraordinary thing about him was mm. he he actually heard performances of very, very few yes, of his in pieces. Yes, I remember reading somewhere that he didn't even care in some cases if his music was performed or not. For, no. for, for him, it just existed as this text, yes. as this score. Yeah. And the, the sounded version was something else that was a sort of accessory to the, yes, the, it, to it, the it literate is logic. Curious. And in fact, mm. the, big, the, the only big success... Leonard Bernstein conducted the second symphony mm. that was broadcast live in something like 1952, which was like a year before he died. Yep. Mm. And he listened to it. He didn't go. He didn't even go. He no. listened to it on the radio in, in his yeah. in, in his home in Connecticut. Mm. Um, but that's so. We recorded all the symphonies, yep. uh, and I'm particularly proud of the fourth yeah. symphony, which is one of the great pieces of the 20th century, but extremely difficult. And so, yeah. And, for but, the orchestra but, or for, for you as a conductor? For, well, it, it needs two conductors, too, uh -huh, as a matter yes. of fact. It's one of those pieces you really, yeah. because, because the orchestra gets divided. And it, it, but it's a, a really amazing mystical piece. So I, that was that was wonderful. Uh, but we've done, I, I remember a particularly fantastic performance of Beethoven 7 we oh. did some years ago. Uh, and so many and, and wonderful soloists we've had working with us. Mm. Renee Fleming, who was a very old friend of mine, came and did a mm. benefit concert. Bryn Terfel came. Oh, okay. And uh, and sang some Wagner and Beethoven Nine, and so uh, and uh, all sorts of great instrumentalists mm. and singers we've had here. So many happy memories, many successes, many musical successes. Yes, uh, and and you know the the joy of making music. Yeah. With a with a group of wonderful. Musicians like this, who, yeah. who are, and I, I love the, the kind of warmth that this orchestra has. Mm. Beautiful string sound, but also mm. great um, solo wind playing and brass mm. and so on. I mean, very great strength all the way through the orchestra. It's interesting. Yesterday, some of the wind players were telling me how much they enjoyed playing the Rite of Spring because it got the orchestra at its most maximum together as a sort of big family, and they they really did embrace that sort of communal aspect of the performance. Th 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 that's absolutely yeah. a feature of, of this orchestra. Yeah. They are like very much like a family. Mm. They care about each other, you know, mm. they, you know for people. Yeah. Are, uh, it's 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 really wonderful, and uh, I felt that the very first time I, I came here for the first time in 2009, my 19-year-old son at the time. 2009, <laughs> and, and I so had, a decade ago. Yes, yes, mm. and we just had a three-week holiday in New Zealand. Ah, but. my neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, mm. you know, the, the, from the very first time I worked with them, I, I just loved mm. the mm. the um, that sense of collective. Yeah. Mm passion in making yeah. music you know i'm sure that collective passion will be will be on display visually and orally in the performances here over the next few days so that brings us to, to the end of our conversation it remains for me to thank sir andrew davis for joining me uh, to wish you uh, best of luck for these for these difficult i think performances over the next couple of days and to say thank you to all those of you who have you uh, who've been listening and joining us on youtube uh, goodbye thank you Goodbye.